And now we have uh, Yoram Boni here who will tell us about uh, silent sea and surprise uh, revealed by involuntary eye movement. Yoram, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like uh, first to thank Uri for recruiting me to this new center and new program, new department maybe, hopefully. And we are now um, about, I think, half a year from when we started, when we have a very nice group of uh, students, master students, and except from Yossi, who is uh, two years already. But um, um, w one note, uh, perhaps you, you see the, I apologize for the flicker. Do you see this tremor or those who are near, maybe those who are far away don't see it. There is a little tremor of the image. I apologize for this, but it gets you uh, a feeling what the brain feels with the tremor of the eyes or with the drift of the eye. But I think that by the end of the talk, you will not see it anymore. That was my experience um, when uh, hearing the others talk. Okay, okay, let's go to the talk. Um, so uh, uh, the title is uh, "Sentiency and Surprise Revealed by Involuntary Eye Movement," and uh, there are three ingredients in this uh, talk, saliency, surprise, and involuntary eye movements. Saliency is a, a simple notion of, of how, how salient is an image. W which one is more salient here? The right one, right? The higher contrast, that's saliency. There's another form of saliency. This one appears to be more salient here, right? This one more salient than this one, right? Okay, this is another form of, uh, of saliency. It's, it's oddball, it pops out. Um, now, in principle, you could add a time uh, scale here, so you can present this one after another. And now you have a sort of, of surprise. This is surprising. You have a sequence of vertical and suddenly comes horizontal. It's a surprise. So there seems to be some similarity between this notion of saliency in, in, in uh, space and surprise in time. So we don't fully understand it now, but we have results with the third ingredient, ingredient of the talk, the involuntary <coughs> eye movement, that sort of dissociate between these two and give us some insights. So uh, when one fixate, the eyes are moving all the time. Uh, this is one degree of visual angle, if you are far away, it's probably all gets into your thumb, it's really one degree. And this is a very uh, large amount of movement, um, covers full heads when I'm looking at the front row here. Uh, and yet, uh, well, it stopped. But um, the, the, the blue is the drift and the red is the micro saccades, and it's a very large movement which we are totally unaware and looks completely random and not, not very interesting, I must say. And I was not specifically interested in that until I realized that it uh, uh, actually conveys a very interesting uh, um, information, which is involuntary, without response. Here's another example. The, um, the, 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 this is a recording, the, the, blue, the uh, yellow here is a recording of the eye movement while someone, uh, the subject is fixating. This experiment was done to see what happens when something disappears. You may see the disappearance of this patch. Anyway, the, the eyes move a lot, quite a lot, and the uh, patch may disappear. Um, uh, we have these uh, movements, they are mi uh, the micro saccade, the drift we've seen, Pursuit is, uh, could be voluntary, but sometimes it's a reflex. Uh, blinks can be spontaneous, and the pupil dilates. Um, and in all, case, all of these cases, it's unintentional, reflexive, and involuntary. And the question is, can we sort of read the mind from the movement of the eyes? Can we infer cognitive processes by analyzing the pattern of in the involuntary eye movement? And um, the answer is yes, because that's, that's the talk. Um, but to some extent, to some extent, gets a very interesting result. Um, we, we are 
just interested in the in the when when things happen and not where. We don't need to really calibrate the, the eye tracker. There is one motivation that started me in my interest in that is the, uh, to test um, non-communicating individual like the, these severely autistics in these pictures. Now we are have uh, uh, two students. Uh, um, master student Owen uh, Kadoshin and Leon Gavelli who are, are testing patients at Levenstein uh, without, uh, with a disorder of consciousness. We want to look at the involuntary eye movements and see if we can get uh, something about their cognition or, or thoughts. Um, so uh, the general goal is to infer the processing uh, from the time course of these movements and there is the saliency and there is the surprise in both of them. Um, I'll show that um, we can assess and measure. Standard method is pretty boring. Huh? No? Okay. Just worked <laughs> before. Anyway, um, uh, so we just uh, uh, watch passively a slideshow of, of flashing things every second like uh, the ball patches and do nothing, or just count them. That's the standard thing. We don't need any answer from the observer. And, um, uh, and um, we get the following. So I, I'll start with the, uh, the basic um, uh, uh, ocular motor inhibition effect. That's the basis of all the results. The, um, the eyes tend to freeze following an event. It can be auditory, visual maybe tactile, any uh, event, transit event. The, these in this plot, we have uh, uh, each dot, a microsaccade, each line is, is a trial. Trial takes here uh, two seconds. Um, and uh, each trial appears a patch of uh, the ball patch, flashed for 400 milliseconds, briefly. So um, we see here inhibition. In this period, there are no microsaccades following the appearance of the ball patch, there is inhibition, and a release of inhibition that comes at a certain time and then goes back to baseline. Um, it happens for visual and auditory as well. Here there is the visual case one, from one data set. It's not specific. Some of the data we collected, visual example in blue and uh, auditory in red. And uh, now we get to the, the things we can measure with this effect. So uh, the first thing is to, to look for saliency and, and uh, we can measure the effect of contrast and the effect of spatial frequency which is sort of equivalent to contrast because the sensitivity, contrast sensitivity changes with, with spatial frequency. Um, this is a very nice um, plot of, of uh, the response to different contrast levels. Somehow similar not, not in time course, but in shape to what people measure in, in V1. Um, so um, the blue here is the same raster plot that uh, I've showed before, but this is for the high contrast, and the red one is for the low contrast. We see the inhibition here. And this is the, uh, 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 just sort of uh, uh, averaging all this together, the, the exact uh, when we do it, it's not important, but you can see uh, a sort of, of a sliding window that uh, computes a rate, a rate and a rate modulation over time. And we see the inhibition and the release. And what we see is that, that for the high contrast, there is a, a strong inhibition and very fast release. And for the low contrast, there is less inhibition and slow release. We can quantify it. We, we, uh, developed here a new method, uh, a measure we call the microsecond reaction time, response time, like the RT of, of, of behavior. And we see that um, um, the onset of inhibition becomes uh, faster with contrast. We are talking about uh, um, uh, here like uh, from 100 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds, that's the onset of inhibition. And release of inhibition goes, uh, uh, becomes as fast as 400 milliseconds, something like that. Um, we do the same thing for spatial frequency. This is a low spatial frequency, high spatial frequency. And we, actually, we can actually reconstruct a con something which is equivalent to a contrast sensitivity function. This is the microsaccade RT. 
as a function of spatial frequency, from low spatial frequency to high spatial frequency, and actually it's become faster with, until it gets here to two cycles per degree, and then it becomes slower. This is the average of like uh, 15 observers, I think. And actually it measures in Z value very nicely the, the threshold, contrast sensitivity threshold of, of these, uh, the same individual. There is a nice correlation across individual. Okay. Um, turns out, quite surprisingly, that exactly the same thing can be seen with eye blinks, spontaneous eye blinks, when you do the same experiment. So when, when, when you are sitting in front of a computer with a, a, a regular flash, you tend, tend not to blink when, when the, the stimulus appears. You sort of postpone your blink to a certain point, but it turns out that the timing of the, the spontaneous blinks, uh, these spontaneous blinks, uh, uh, is, is uh, related to the special frequency and contrast. Here I, I show uh, uh, contrast, the contrast effect, and it's very, very similar to, to, to the, the microscope. Very similar, except, but except that they are uh, uh, five times more microsecads than, than uh, or seven times more microsecads than nine things, but we get exactly the same result. Here, the, here is for the um, special frequency. As you can see, before the similar onset, there, there's nothing. There is very little eye blinks. And uh, after that, there is this um, uh, sort of similar uh, release time, which is faster for high contrast and slower for low contrast. And also the magnitude of the response or the probability for eye blink is lower for lower contrast. And on the right, we see that a very similar um, uh, blink RT, which is uh, related to the, the contrast sensitivity. This is the blink RT, this is the microsecond RT. Okay, uh, it turns out that this further generalizes, this is the work for of in Balziv, um, it generalizes beyond fixation eye movement. Actually, if maybe this would work, um, yeah, this works. So, um, if you are doing smooth pursuit and a flash appears, right, do you see the, the, these patches that appears flashed in the middle? Can you see it or it's too low? Yeah. You can see it, okay. So when this happens, so you are, are watching this and your, the instruction is to follow the, the, this ring. When you do that and uh, uh, comes a, a f first we know that there are microsecond during the pursuit. On top of the pursuit movement, there are these little bumps. Maybe catch up, I don't know exactly. Not always it's clear that it's a catch up saccade, but they are very small. They can be 0.3 uh, degrees, very small. Legal micro saccades that follow uh, uh, on the pursuit, but they are inhibited following the onset of this uh, uh, transit capo patch in exactly the same manner as during fixation. Okay, so that's the first generalization. And uh, we can plot the um, result. We don't see something here for the low contrast, but basically even for the low spatial frequency, this is the spatial frequency, and this is the microsaccade RT during smooth pursuit. Okay? Okay, it's the same thing, basically, very simple. The second interesting thing is that the pursuit itself also inhibits or slows down. This is like, uh, let's say I'm uh, walking and suddenly comes something, so I'm slowing down. And the slowdown is related to the stimulus. So if there is a, a, a this is the a lower spatial frequency which are more salient, then there is a, a larger slowdown. And if it's a higher spatial frequency, there is a smaller slowdown. This slowdown comes at around, around 200 milliseconds. Okay. All right, now we move to the surprise part. Um, um, so uh, we are talking about very simple surprises, um, but we know all that uh, things can be uh, surprise, uh, surprising in terms of the what, the where, and the when of things. Um, Maybe uh, examples here, oddball in a sequence, color, pitch, uh, 
object moving behind uh, occlusion, we have, uh, we have the prediction, and then when it goes in another way, it's surprised. Uh, if the metronome suddenly breaks and it's out of, of sync, then we, we hear it's a surprise and so on. But we do a very simple experiment, so we make a, sequ a sequence of Gabor patches high and low contrast, that's one experiment. And we find that when the high contrast was, uh, but by the way, they appear in, in random order in 50-50% uh, uh, chance of appearance. And when the high contrast appears after three high contrast patches, uh, we see it in red, the release is faster. When it appears after three low contrast patches, this is in red. This is a surprise. A surprise here means a slower, a delay. It's the opposite of saliency in this sense. Okay, the opposite of saliency. And we can do it in all of the, these uh, 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 formats, but we have a different way of computing it. So now we have the microsecad RT, and we can plot the microsecad RT as a, of, for each trial as a function of the history of preceding events. And here we show, uh, we put zero here as the average microsecad RT, independent of the history of events. This is for the high contrast. And when the high contrast was preceded for, by one or more, two or more, three or more, four or more, and you can see the dot here, um, the microscale of T became shorter. 10 milliseconds per item, about 40 milliseconds, because things are as expected. So it comes a high contrast and a second high contrast. Now you are predicting that the third one, the fourth, and so on will be high contrast, and it comes exactly as you predicted and you become faster and faster, until it saturates, of course. But when there is a sequence of low contrast and comes a high contrast, one or more, two or more, three or more, four or more preceding low contrast patches, now you become slower, 10 milliseconds per item. Okay, that's the way we plot it. This, exactly the same thing happens with when you do audio-visual, a modality shift. So you did have a beep or a, a patch, and we get a similar result for the audio. It doesn't work so well when looking at the visual part, but when looking at the auditory part, if the, the beep was preceded by one or more, two or more, and so on beeps, it becomes faster. And the opposite when it's preceded by vision. And we can do a position thing. We have had some data from another experiment. We see very similar pattern of results. And this is sort of a summary. We have it also for color. And this is the position, and this is for modality. And the principle is that repetition uh, um, shortens the inhibition. And uh, um, uh, change lengthens the inhibition, or, or slow down. Okay? So a change means a surprise. A surprise is, a, is slowing you. Something surprising happens, you need to reconsider. Um, it happens also for the eye blinks. It happens also for the eye blinks, and it nicely relates to what people uh, tell about eye blinks. Uh, um, here's an example. Laura didn't even blink when I told her that the car was stolen, meaning that she pretended not to be surprised. Or meaning that uh, when you blink, you are ex expressing a surprise. Okay. Um, so what we see here, in the same data set, um, here are data set of the position, when there was a surprise, there are delayed blinks and more blinking. Probability of blinking is higher and it is delayed. And actually we take the blink RT and plot the same plots uh, and get very similar pattern. Um, I won't go into this, just want to show you that a simple model that looks at the history of events and computed, computes the probability of the next event to be from type A or type B based on the recent past works very well. I don't have time to go over it, but you can replicate the cup. Okay. Um, we can also predict time. So we can, uh, let's say, if you, we uh, mix a, a, a short and long uh, interval, we see a, a, a surprise effect, and it goes shorter, and I'll just show you the pattern that we are familiar. 
It can be a, a, a one second and 1.2 seconds interval coming in random order. So when there is a repetition of one second, suddenly comes a longer one, there is a, a longer inhibition. And, uh, well, I don't have time to, um, to anticipate temporal anticipation, pretty precise. And, oh, well, I have extra time. A few more seconds, and <laughs> I got to the conclusion. Okay. Um, eye movements, the involuntary eye movements, are inhibited following a perceptual event. The microsaccade, the drift, the blinks, the spontaneous blinks. This inhibition depends on the stimulus, uh, uh, saliency, and attention, and can be used to assess contrast sensitivity in passive viewing. The inhibition also depends on the level of surprise as defined by the history of preceding perceptual events. Um, surprise uh, uh, makes a longer inhibition. More saliency makes a shorter inhibition. The, uh, this uh, occurs in various stimulus dimension, uh, contrast, color, audiovisual, modality shift, and uh, time. It could be useful for assessing uh, non-communicating individual. Um, so this is a, a picture that my son made with uh, some drawing and Photoshop manipulation, trying to ask him to to uh, draw the inner eye in the brain or something like that or some idea. Anyway, and this was done. Uh, most of the work was done uh, before uh, coming to Barilan. Uh, with these people, primarily from Weizmann Institute, and now I have uh, some students, and I'm hoping that to get more results in a short time. Thank you. <laughs>